if an unbeliever comes into a worship service, if they walk out of that worship service still unconverted and also saying, wow, that was really cool, we've, we've completely failed. Hi, I'm Evelyn Ray. Welcome to The Cauldron Pool Show. Today, I am joined with Les Lanfear. He's a Christian filmmaker, and I'm really excited to sort of talk to him today about some of his uh, projects he's done in the past and some new ones that he has that are going to be coming out very shortly. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. You have the best podcast. It's it's really <laughs> awesome. That's coming from somebody who's done a podcast himself. Um, so thank you. I, I don't think I agree with you, but I'll take the compliment <laughs> anyway. Um, now, I wanted to sort of get a little bit into your history because Christian Filmmaker, I feel is, while it, on its own is an amazing thing, you're actually a little bit more uh, complex than just that. And you've, you've got an incredible background, um, not just in Christian filmmaking, but with animation, visual effects, directing, and you've had um, a lot of experience in different fields. So if you don't mind, just for um, the audience over here who are tuning in, are you able to give a little bit of your background, who you are, and what got you into Christian filmmaking? Uh, yeah, so I got, uh, I was saved when I was like 19, and then I moved to Florida, uh, and it was kind of a long, it was a package deal. The Lord sort of moved me from Pennsylvania to Florida right along time me getting uh, saved. And uh, while I was here in Florida, um, I, I'm like, I'm not a, I didn't, never went to college. I never did anything, you know, to, to plan my actual life. No, the Lord just had plans for me. Uh, and uh, so this millionaire in Florida uh, decided that he wanted to buy a uh, visual effects studio from LA. And then he decided that Port St. Lucie, Florida, which is where I live, uh, would be a good place to set up sort of a branch of that visual effects studio. Um, and then he did, uh, they called it a job fair and they like extended this, uh, this invitation for people all over the city to just come and, you know, if you know, Photoshop, if you know, like whatever design things. Um, and so I put together a little reel and I submitted it and they selected like 25 of us and they trained us, uh, in post-production visual effects for Hollywood movies. So it was just this like insane circumstance. And uh, so I was trained and I, you know, within uh, six months or so, I was working on Transformers 3. Uh, I worked on uh, the Smurfs, uh, all these live action sort of live action animation, you know, mixed together sort of movies. Um, unfortunately, after a few years, the whole thing went bankrupt because uh, the L.A. office didn't like the, the Florida office competing with them. It seemed like it was a lot of politics. But uh, that opportunity gave me uh, other opportunities uh, were kind of a the visual effects uh, community. It's pretty close knit. So you drop names and encourage people to come out to where you're at and all these, all these other places. And uh, so I got to work on some other movies. I worked on Epic, which is a fun little animated movie about a little girl that gets shrunk down in her backyard. And my daughter was born when I was working on that movie. So her name's in the credits. She's an Epic baby. Uh, so yeah, I've just had these, uh, incredible opportunities. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I got to work on Hollywood movies. I started a podcast, uh, shortly after that. And, uh, that was pretty popular. We drank beer and we talked about theology and it was sort of the boom of the, there was a big Calvinism phase uh, a few years ago with, uh, with my age group, I guess you could say. Uh, but also a craft beer boom. And those two things collided in our show. And uh, so that got pretty popular. And uh, I used that, the audience that I grew from that uh, eventually to sort of put all that together, my love of theology, my history of at least some knowledge of how, how movies work. And I put together a Kickstarter to make a movie called Calvinist, which was about, uh, about the, the resurgence of Calvinism in America over the past 20 or so years at the time. And uh, so that's that's kind of what got me into uh, producing my own films. 
And are you still involved, um, like apart from your own Christian filmmaking, are you still involved in other sort of projects for films um, with Hollywood or, or anywhere else? Uh, I'm actually waiting, possibly, uh, there's a studio in, in Canada that uh, is interested in, in uh, working on some, some top secret projects. Um, so yeah, it's always kind of out there. I do freelance stuff for, for uh, you know, all over the place, but um, I mostly am focused on making my own, my own productions at the moment. Sounds like a really um, once in a lifetime opportunity that you had back in Florida when you were selected one of the 25 people that like that sounds like a movie within itself um, that you were able to sort of do those things, which is um, I think, you know, you can look back on those things and you go, oh, that's a bit of providence right there. You can see how things were working along the way um, to put you in this position. And I'm grateful that you have that experience and I'm grateful that you're in a position where you can do Christian filmmaking because um, I think it's something that we really need and it's there's there's a bit of a void a bit of a lack of and so we're seeing like the rise of a lot of Christian filmmakers I don't I'm not sure if you're aware of law TV um, I interviewed yeah. Marcus the yeah the the owner of that the CEO of that and there's just a lot of opportunities for Christians to really step up in the creative space um, and to get some really good information out there. So I'm really excited about that. But I um, wanted to sort of Actually, touch. When, when I was in Arizona, I was, uh, when I was doing my podcast, uh, Us and Apologia, which Marcus was a big part of, uh, mm. the Apologia Studios and podcast, we, we collaborated and we, we did something called ReformCon in Arizona. We did this whole show together. It was, it was a lot of fun. But uh, Marcus did a talk there, Marcus Pittman, uh, mm -hmm. who now is the CEO of Lore. Uh, and it was all just like encouraging Christians to like get out there and do something for Jesus and, uh, you know, all the history of, of Christian technology and stuff. But that speech is actually what encouraged me. I got, I got back home and I'm like, I got to make a movie. Uh, so that was Mar Marcus is one of the biggest inspirations. So I, I know Marcus well, and uh, I'm mm -hmm. so glad that uh, you had him on your show. Oh, that's incredible. And what I'm learning, the more I sort of uh, do this podcast and, and sort of talk to people is that there is a real like community happening behind the scenes at the moment, which is exciting because I feel for such a long time, we've been so desperate for this strong, godly community. And it's like, you know, the world, when you look outside your window, it just looks like it's turning um, to, to, to crap, basically. It's just yeah. turning um, wicked and it looks just so rotten, but behind closed doors and, and like the cogs are turning, Christians are coming together, Christians are, you know, doing some really good things. And I think it's, you know, from the ashes, this is going to like really sort of rise and, and um, come forward all for the glory of God, which I'm really excited about. I wanted to touch on and I really wanted to ask you what the sort of atmosphere is like in your end of the world, because over here in Australia, uh, Calvinism reformed theology is probably very minor so i am um, often criticized very harshly because i'm a calvinist because i'm reformed in theology and um it's sort of like i'm i would say i'm in one of the very different christian categories over here because of those particular views uh people like doug wilson jeff durbin james white you know all, all those sort of men that i really respect and admire a lot of people haven't heard of them over here um funnily enough and they've sort of learned of them through me saying you've really got to uh listen and watch these people so is it like that where you're from or is it a little bit more mainstream um well the uh so like i like it, i said uh calvinist was sort of about a a resurgence that happened uh in, in america i guess uh I, th I think it sort of spread all over the place but um there was probably 20 years ago or so this uh, this real sense that like, you know, I guess it happens in every culture. Christianity sort of gets to a place where it gets very stale or very, um, uh, the, the church just gets kind of either cold or in a, a rut, which is, I don't know. I'm sure you see what happens on American uh, American television, uh, sort of Christianity. And actually, I guess you guys gave us Hillsong, right? Uh, thank you <laughs> Sorry for, about thank that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but that sort of, that sort of thing is, is what Christianity was sort of 
becoming. And I think um, my generation, for whatever reason, started to really look at it and just be very dissatisfied. Um, you know, I was a, I, I was converted when I was um, 19. And uh, as I started to really learn what you take, take Christianity seriously, I, I was very dissatisfied by the whole thing too. And I was at a Calvary chapel that was encouraging me to read, read the Bible. And uh, while I was there, this big group of young people started to talk about this thing called Calvinism and it got sort of circulated in the church and it became a really bad word. So if you're a Calvinist, you better, you, you might as well just leave. And uh, I, so I hated it because I was a Calvary Chapel fanboy. And uh, as I started to investigate it um, and people started challenging me, then I was getting sermons uh, by, you know, Paul Washer and, uh, you know, R.C. Sproul. There, the, people started sending me this stuff. And uh, so then I discovered it. And I feel like that. So, so Calvinist, the movie is a product of the fact that it wasn't just me. This was happening all over America. And uh, then my, with my podcast, I started to connect to all these people that were like, you know, very new to this stuff and Calvinism sort of blew their mind and refreshed their whole view of what Christianity was. Uh, and that's, that's really what it is. Like Calvinism is this incredible historic biblical uh, theology that just, it makes God big and impressive in a way, in a way that, um, you know, a lot of Western Christianity just has completely forgotten. Yeah, it's, I, I grew up um, in, I would say more of an Arminian type of church. Um, and in my sort of teenage years, I went to, I would say not a Hillsong church, but something in that spectrum. And when I was 18, I joined the police and it's funny, I, um, I would have thought that I was a Christian, but I most certainly probably was not living as a Christian. And later in my life, um, like I would say my early sort of 20s, I became reformed in theology. And after all those years, I found out my nan, my 90 something year old grandmother has been reformed her whole life and just sort of praying and hoping wow. that the rest of the family goes that way. And so that was such a, like, an amazing sort of realization for me. And I started going to the church that my nan went to, which was all reformed. Um, and my auntie started going there. And it was just, it was this real amazing feeling. I felt at home for the first time in, in my life. But later in life, as I said, I um, was in a position where somebody that I went through the police academy with reached out to me and said, Evelyn, I've just found your social media pages. I've just done this. I had no idea you were a Christian. I've recently become a Christian and found you. And whilst that was encouraging that she became a Christian and she found me and obviously I'm presented online as a Christian, it just was just like a dagger to the heart because I was like, she had no idea that I was a Christian back when I was 18. And I probably would have yeah. said that I was. And it's just funny how people who would have known me then wouldn't have thought that I was a Christian, but people now there's just no doubt. It's like, they probably hate me because I'm so Christian now. Um, and so like yeah. what, you know, black and white on things, this is how it is, but it all comes down to theology. It really does. And my theology is now reformed. I am a Calvinist. I am a cessationist um, and um, very much grounded in sola scriptura. You know, scripture alone is sufficient. And it's amazing how everybody that I went to church with, um, who was that Hillsong movement, are no longer Christians. Well, I would doubt that they even were a Christian to begin with, but all of them are now atheists or they actually actively go out of their way to hate the church and to hate God. And, and it's like this big thing. And it just breaks my heart that I, I honestly think theology is what happens. And there was, I think that you were involved with this film, American Gospel. Um, yeah. And it took, yeah, it's incredible because that resonated a lot with me because that's sort of where I came from. Um, I'm not sure if you wanted to sort of go into that film a little bit, but that the prosperity gospel and all of those things that came with it was really eye opening. Yeah, yeah, it's an awesome movie. Uh, so Brandon Kimber, uh, another uh, f fantastic filmmaker, 
Um, he reached out to me when I was sort of in between Calvinist. And then my second movie was called Spirit and Truth, uh, specifically about reformed worship. So there's sort of a specific way that reformed people have always understood that worship should be done. And again, it's focused on God being big and sovereign and uh, what he says matters. But in between those two projects, uh, Brandon Kimber reached out to me and uh, asked, you know, if I was available. And so I worked on the animation, all the animation for for uh, American Gospel. Uh, so that movie is basically about like, I mean, he, goes, he runs through a lot. He runs through Roman mm-hmm. Catholicism and the errors in that. And yeah, the the uh, prosperity gospel and charismania and all that stuff. So it's there's a lot in there. And the whole idea is um, that, you know, there's there's an Americanized version of the gospel that has that isn't at all the gospel. And it does a really great job of um, just presenting the pure, unadulterated, uh, saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. I think Ali Beth Stuckey, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I, I listen to her quite a lot. I, I, I value her voice in this space and she calls it Big Eva. Well, I'm not sure if she can take uh, copyright of that term, but that's the first yeah. time I heard of that term through her podcast. Um, and it is like that. You've got big tech, you've got big media, you've got big corporations, all these things. And now you've got Big Eva. And you're right. I think a lot of that has been birthed through this Americanized gospel. Um, but I think, you know, I guess Australia has a bit of a part in that, as you mentioned, because of our Hillsong movement as well. So we're not completely innocent in this sort of prosperity gospel as well. But I want to talk about um, your film Calvinist, and I'm going to ask you to go into some of your other films as well. But a lot of people over here say to me, what's a Calvinist, Evelyn? And I always send them to R.C. Sproul's chalkboard, the tulip, and I, I, that's sort of where I send people first. But if you can kind of summarize it in a way that people might be able to digest it pretty easily and help them understand the difference between being, I guess, Calvinist in theology over Arminianism and free will, if you can kind of do your best to sort of explain that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the the big... Well, okay, so the Calvinism is a result of uh, the Reformation, which was basically Martin Luther looked at the Roman Catholic Church and saw just corruption coming out of his ears, just all all kinds of corruption. And, you know, they were charging money for the gospel and for salvation and for uh, indulgences and all these things. So the Reformation was a rediscovery of uh, the gospel, specifically justification by faith alone. And so we now, everybody in even Big Eva, as you, as you mentioned, um, we all want to say that we're Protestants. So we protested away from Rome. Uh, we're not Catholics. And we see like the Pope is bad and, you know, Mary's bad, you know, worshiping Mary's bad and all that stuff. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is there's an actual theology that came out of the Reformation, and uh, ultimately it was what we now call Calvinism. Um, and during sort of that that stream of thought that was coming away from uh, Rome, there was another another split that happened. Uh, we call it the Remonstrance, but that that was where what we call Arminianism broke off from the, the real reform stream, which was, was Calvinistic. You could throw the Lutherans in there too. That, that complicates things a little bit, but you know, that's not big Eva is certainly not Lutheran. Um, so now, now you have this, this sort of disagreement in the, in the, the Protestant movement. Uh, and it's all about the nature of salvation. Uh, so how, what do we mean when we say God is sovereign? Right. So so God is sovereign. He's he's kingly. He uh, whatever he says goes. He's he's in control of things. Those are things that everybody sort of wants to say. But how sovereign? And, you know, it comes down to the question really of free will versus God's sovereignty and uh, in specifically in salvation. So uh, the big distinction and the, the, the big thing that's offensive to a lot of Christians uh, is this idea that God chooses who he's going to save. Uh, and, you know, the, the flip side of that is that he passes over others and chooses not to save them. 
So, uh, so there, there is election and there's choice and there's something that, you know, a lot of, a lot of people look at that and they say that it's unfair, but, um, for one, it's just prevalent throughout all of scripture. Um, you know, you can't deny that God chose this nation of Israel, uh, a nation the size of Florida in the Middle East, and then it's just surrounded by the whole rest of the world. And God didn't deal with any of those people for thousands of years. He had nothing to do with them. He revealed himself only to Israel. So that's election. That's a choice that he made. Um, and then, you know, God God explains his choice throughout scripture that, that he has the prerogative, he has the freedom to make this choice. But if we really understand the nature of man, that we're dead in our sins, that we, by nature, we're guilty before God, then we, we also understand that we would never choose Jesus on our own. We're actually spiritually dead. We have no desire for God. And so something has to happen. We have to be, uh, we, we have to have our eyes opened. We have to be brought to spiritual life. And that's something that God does to people. And if he doesn't do it, if he doesn't do it, then it doesn't happen. So there is no such thing as free will and salvation because we we can't choose Jesus on our own. And, and so there, now you have all of these ideas working together that God has to choose a person for them to be saved. And then Jesus has to specifically die for that person. Um, and if he, if he dies for those who go to heaven, well, what about those who go to hell? It's clear that he didn't die for their sins. He, he couldn't have, or else they would be, in heaven. If Jesus died for somebody, their sins are paid for, then they will be in heaven. So now we have that idea. And then we have also just this idea that God has to specifically come to you and bring you to life. And if he doesn't do that, then you stay lost in your sins. So, you know, the, the big question is, why doesn't he save everyone? And there's a, you know, there's long explanations for that, but the, but the Bible is very clear. God has a purpose in saving, and he has a purpose in leaving people in their sins. He wants to demonstrate his his uh, righteous wrath, and he wants to demonstrate his mercy. And he actually wants both of those things to exist. Um, as unpopular as that is to say, God actually does want want to uh, demonstrate his his anger and his wrath. So, uh, but but the glory is that God saves sinners, and uh, if you understand, you know Calvinism as sort of a very shakily summarized there, then you can appreciate grace in a way that you couldn't otherwise, because that means that I truly do not deserve this. I should be in hell. And if I were left to my own devices, I would be in hell. But for an, a reason unknown to me, as far as God's choice, he did choose to come to me in my sin, in my rebellion. And he, pulled me out of the muck and the mire and he made me a believer that's and that's grace that like i said you just can't appreciate otherwise hmm. i think the really helpful thing that um sort of got me over that tipping edge when i was dabbling in reformed theology was and and i can't for the life of me remember who, which theologian said it but it was this one simple phrase that i it just like was a switch it clicked and i was like that's it I now understand um, election um, and, you know, I now understand, um, you know, those things. And it was, it was this, it was instead of looking at everything and going, that's unfair. Like, why would God choose these people over these people? You have to change the way that you think and stop saying that's not fair. Why this, why that? And you need to say, why would he choose any of us because when you understand total depravity and when you understand that we are born sinful um, that we are born wicked we're not born innocent by any means um, and when you understand just the depravity of your sin then you can sort of start to change the way that you view grace like you mentioned and you know why would he even pick me at all is the real question that we should be asking none of us deserve his grace none of us deserve his mercy and none of us certainly deserve christ dying on the cross for us to take the the burden and to justify us before god um and so he, I guess changing the way that I look at it um, made me kind of go, who am I to say what's right and what's wrong and what's just and what's unjust? Who am I um, to even think that I have the right um, perspective on any of this? Because I am 
um, depraved by nature. And another thing that I kind of um, have tried to come, well, I've had to sort of come to terms with is trying to explain Bible verses to people because a lot of people say, what about John 3, 16? You know, what, what about all these other verses that say, say this? And something I've realized is people don't know how to read the Bible, especially contextually, and especially like words like therefore. Um, if you look at the Greek um, or even in the Hebrew, if you look at simple words like therefore, it's like, well, you've got to read the paragraph before to understand because it's specific to therefore because of what was said previously this is what happens and a lot of yeah. people don't really understand that is that something you have found as well around the misunderstandings of reform theology oh absolutely yeah 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 i mean it's there's 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 so many preconceived notions that you that everybody has as they go into scripture and uh you know you, you talked about that that earlier time in your life when you were a Christian, but people didn't even know it compared to now. And, you know, that's just the beauty of sanctification uh, being made more like Christ. And that happens through us reading our Bible and starting to think God's thoughts after him. And I, there's always these like really cool moments in the life of a Christian when you, you start to read the scriptures and you realize like that kind of aligns with the way I think. Like I, I, I think like God, I'm starting to actually like understand the way God thinks and, um, and you, you, your worldview is changing. Um, and that's, that's the, the beauty of, of sanctification is that we, we begin thinking more like God, but especially in the beginning when you, or unfortunately, if you get stuck in traditions that are teaching you, uh, just unbiblical ideas, um, words get defined in the wrong way and they, they start to make you think um things or you like avoid certain words you skip over them and you don't think too much about them like election uh like predestination um like, uh, words like this that, like there's a lot of people that like they don't even realize it's in the bible um but yeah there's once like you said when the when the the switch flips uh you see it everywhere in scripture and then you're just like, how in the world did I miss this? It's it's on every page. Like, like he's he's choosing, he's choosing Abraham, he's choosing Moses, he's he's condemning Pharaoh, hardening his heart while setting the people free. Like God is just in control of all of this, and he's unapologetic about the fact that he uses people as vessels of wrath, just as in the same way that he uses people as vessels of mercy. And he's completely free to do that. And he never apologizes for it. Mm, absolutely. I think so often and we talk about the love of God, but we never talk about the wrath of God. We're only getting half of his goodness because in understanding his wrath, we can then understand things like his grace and his mercy and things like that. And I think having a greater understanding of those things is a sanctification in itself because it changes the way as a Christian you live your life. And something as well that really helped me is um, if I believe in free will and Arminianism and that spectrum of theology, I'm basically putting the power and the authority in the will of man and not the will and sovereign will of God. And it's saying it basically what it says, if you actually look at it logically, it kind of is saying, well, this person, uh, Mark, is better than this person, John, because Mark had stronger character to be able to accept the gospel over John. And it kind of puts a, too much power in the character of man, which if you understand total depravity is wicked. And I think Paul Washer, you mentioned him before, um, a lot of people don't like him. A lot of people think he's too harsh, but I actually think he's wonderful. And he gave a sermon yeah. once um, about total depravity and he spoke about a baby and he said, you know, you think babies are innocent. Oh, goo goo gaga, you hold a baby, here's a toy. But he said, if that baby had strength and, and things like the things that it could do, and he, and he uses a watch as an example. And he said, you see a baby, yeah. look at a watch and the baby will do everything, wants to grab the watch and grab it, grab it. it's mine, it's mine. And they said, if that child, that baby, 
baby had the strength of an adult, they'd probably get a knife, pick it up, cut your throat, take the watch off your wrist and run away with it. <laughs> um, and everyone was a bit like, oh, Paul, like you can't talk like that. But it's a pr pretty good reflection on the total depravity and understanding the inherited nature of man and how it's only by God's grace that there is anything good in us. Um, and the goodness is from God alone. Um, so that was super helpful. But um, yeah, I, I love um, the transitions that I've seen in people's lives where they've sort of been very, um, I, I would say, weak or diluted in theology, and you can see the sanctification. And they always end up in the same spot. People that you sort of look at and you're like, wow, what an incredible man or woman of God. It, when it comes down to it and you get to their theology, it is all Calvinist, whether they like to use the word or not. That's kind of where the real um, rooted deep in scripture theology comes from. That's in my experience anyway. But I want to hear more about your other um, documentaries, uh, Spirit and Truth, I think you mentioned. And did you also work on one, um, Logic on Fire? Am I right? In uh, that's not me. But that's the partner that's not you. that I'm. Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the okay. partners that I'm going to be making this new movie with. Uh, so, right. Spirit and Truth is yeah. So, specifically about Reformed worship, um, and there's a there's a term called the regulative principle of worship. Um, so, once again, another product of the Reformation. Uh, so, you know, we we've mentioned Hillsong a couple of times. Uh, mm there's a there's a a philosophy that allows a church to worship in the way that a church like Hillsong does and unfortunately uh, uh, every mega church in the world it seems is trying to just be Hillsong uh, most of the time um so like does it matter how we approach god that's that's the question and that's sort of the question of the movie and uh, the regulative principle of worship, the, the whole idea. So, you know, back in the Reformation times, it was all pretty traditional, at least you could say traditional. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church had their stained glass and they but then they had things like the mass. They had uh, all these these weird additional uh, ways that they worshiped God. And uh, as the Reformation moved forward, they really just looked at everything that the Roman Catholics were doing. And they said, this is just completely unbiblical. This is made up by men. Um, and so if, if, if when you read the pages of scripture, uh, do we see God caring how we approach him? Or do we see God saying, if you have a gift and a talent, just use it however you want in, when you approach me in worship. And I'll take any kind of worship because I'm just that kind of God. I want to be worshiped and that's all that matters. And as long as it sounds good to you and you like it, then you can do it. Um, if you actually read scripture, that's exactly the opposite of the way God thinks about worship. He kills people. If they use the wrong kind of fire in the temple, he literally mm. uh, engulfs them in flames and, and kills them when they bring the wrong fire. Uh, when people touch the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which is an instrument used in worship, if they just touch it, he kills them because it's holy. Um, so God cares very much about how he's approached. And so spirit and truth is, is really just, a an unpacking of, you know, let's, let's remember that God sets the parameters for worship and especially sola scriptura, uh, that we, that is the, if, if the Bible is the source of all truth, and it's the one thing that God wants us to receive in order to change us and make us more like Jesus, then we shouldn't be adding anything. We shouldn't be inventing anything to put up on that stage next to the word of God that'll distract us away from the word of God. So it's, it's God clearly says he doesn't want these extra things. And then it's also a distraction and it hinders our growth. So on every level, it's bad. And the, the movie uh, tries to at least uh, make a, a case for um, very simple, uh, strategic, purposeful worship. And at the end of the day, it's not so much about traditional worship versus contemporary worship. 
and people are used to those categories and they don't want to go to the the lame church that does traditional worship. Um, it's not about those categories. It's, it's about what does God actually want? And we shouldn't do anything beyond that. We should only do what he wants. And at the end of the day, it ends up looking like what you would typically call a traditional, um, but probably even more simple than most traditional churches because uh, God, he, he's not asking for, for anything frivolous. And so simplicity is key. And uh, understanding that I think is really important. Yeah, that's really, I, I, I'm going to be honest, I haven't watched that particular one, Spirit and Truth, but I'm going to watch it now because I'm curious how you present this. Because like you said, so often it's people say, well, you know, traditionalism and um, contemporary type of creativity shouldn't be, you know, you can you can be contemporary in your worship and you can be this. So I'm, I'm actually really interested in how you presented this argument and how you presented it. Um, and so I, that's going to be my homework. I'm going to do that over the next couple of days because um, it's something that I struggle to articulate as well when people ask me about that. I come from a very traditional church now. So I it's a very small church. Not many people go there um, and that everybody there and everybody children who are there are all saved are all like deep in the word of God and it's just beautiful and it's interesting as I mentioned in my earlier years I came from a church where there was smoke machines where there was a dance like instead of just having a worship team who played the piano the drums the guitar and who sang there was a dance team as well that would dance for the church um super distracting and as you mentioned like a simplistic worship um is is certainly raw and real and i remember um a friend of mine went to bible college and one of the lecturers pulled um uh the class aside and was talking about how the church needs to keep up with the times and all of this and she actually stood up and 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 respectfully disagreed with the lecturer and because she went to my church and she said I, i'd actually like to disagree with you we only sing hymns at church out of the book. We only do this, yet we have the biggest young adult group pretty much in our entire area of Australia that's coming here. So obviously this church is doing something right without the contemporary worship stuff. So um, I'm actually gonna get her to watch this um, film as well, because I'm sure she would have loved to have been able to articulate it better than she did back then. But um, yeah, really, really good su subject that I think um, is really uh, helpful for us. So um, that probably is a good. I think a lot of. I, so, sorry, just one one last thing. No, I think, I think we we forget that like we're participating in a religion. It's like we're we're ashamed of that, and you know, especially with with big big Eva sort of Christianity now. And so we have the rock show mentality because we think we're entertaining people, but like you know, other religions aren't aren't ashamed of the fact that they have, they have, you know, uh, ceremonies and they have things that if you weren't a part of that religion, you'd be very uncomfortable taking part in. If I went to like some like serious Buddhist, like ceremony, I'm sure I'd be like, what the heck is going on? And I'd walk, I'd walk out, you know, very uncomfortable. And we shouldn't, we, we need to stop being ashamed of the fact that we're practicing a religion. Uh, God himself has told us what he wants from us. And so if an unbeliever comes into a worship service, if they walk out of that worship service still unconverted and also saying, wow, that was really cool, we've, we've completely failed. Like True. they shouldn't think that was really cool. They should think either they're convicted of their sin or they should think those people are crazy. Those are those are the only things that they should be thinking. They, they shouldn't be like entertained by our by our actual worship of the mm. one and only God. Yeah, that's so true. The youth group that I went to as well, it was like getting people in the doors, but it didn't get butts on seats, you know, to stay. Yeah. And it was like, it was just cool youth group with skateboard ramps and, you know, all this music and disco and all these things, but people would come in and out. It was like a pendulum, just this door that constantly, you know, swung open and shut. And I think you're right, we need to make it so if people are coming in the door, their butts are seated on that seat and they're there every Sunday. And that's the, the ultimate goal. Um, and you're right. 
I think people don't like the word religion because what it has become, people get scared of organized religion. So you get a lot of Christians today who say, oh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, or I, I don't I don't like religion, religion is this, but you know, at the end of the day, it is, it is what it is and you've got to cut the fat off the meat and um, Christianity is a religion and we practice that religion. So you're right, it's something we should be talking about more and should be more unapologetic about and unashamed of um, ultimately. And it's our own shame in, in things that um, hold us back and hold us back, I guess, on obeying God's, or God's law by spreading the gospel um, across the world. So yeah, but I want to segue into your newest film. That's kind of the main reason I want, like, and the more questions I wanted to ask you about and we sort of spoke about Christianity, sanctification, and my path has been I've gone from sort of uh, Baptist, sort of Arminianism, uh, I've become Calvinist, Reform. My next uh, transition in my faith was I became a cessationist. And then from there now, I'm a post-millennialist. So I feel like there's been these big key moments in my theology as I've gone. But when I became a cessationist, I it, it was hit with almost or equally as much criticism as when I became a Calvinist. But you've done a whole film on this. So I don't want to I don't want to tell people what it's about. I'd love for you to explain what your newest Christian film cessationist is about uh, what got you wanting to do a film about this to begin with. Well, it doesn't exist yet, so I need to <laughs> to put, do a, a I'll do another plug at the end. But it quickly, there's currently a Kickstarter going for this movie this movie cessationist. So uh, if if you're listening now, go check it out. Go to Kickstarter uh, C E S S E T cessation I O N I S T cessationist. Uh, so uh, cessationism is the idea that uh, the, the apostolic miraculous gifts that we see in the New Testament, things like speaking in tongues, prophecy, uh, mm -hmm. healing, uh, just spontaneous healing, uh, even raising the dead, these are things that we see in the New Testament, these miracles. Um, and uh, there's a lot of churches that are practicing these things. Um, and you know, to varying degrees, uh, you can think it's very weird uh, what they're doing. But a lot of people think this is like the right way to practice Christianity. And um, so so cessationism is basically saying that there was a time, there was a place for those gifts. They had a purpose and that time has has passed uh, as far as God assigning uh, offices to people that they're able to just do these things whenever they want. And it's, it's sort of their, their gift, uh, that, that time has passed and, uh, the, the purpose of it also has passed. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the point of the movie is to, you know, we're, we're going to talk about things like speaking in tongues, which I'm sure most of us have some idea of what, what that looks like, uh, out in the, the church world. But, uh, even that practice, that, that's an easy one to pick on because uh, what they're doing, that like speaking in gibberish and then somebody uh, maybe interprets that tongue, that at least they're trying to be biblical in, in that way if they have an interpreter. Um, that is not at all what was actually happening in the New Testament, for one. Like that, I mean, that's a starting point. Uh, speaking in tongues, uh, the day of Pentecost this, this flame came upon all the people in this upper room that were praying, including the apostles, and they came down out of that upper room, and a miracle began when they started speaking in languages that they themselves didn't know. It, that's, that's the miracle. They were speaking languages that they didn't know, and they were preaching the gospel to people who were in that crowd that did know those languages. So God was was. Uh, crossing a language barrier miraculously by speaking through them with tongues that they themselves didn't know. And so people were hearing the gospel. Other people said that they sounded like they were drunk because they hadn't heard those languages before. Um, but God used that to, uh, that was like the first massive explosion of conversions 
Uh, the day of Pentecost, Peter preaches this incredible uh, message, and thousands of people are added to the church that day. And that's the real beginning of the, the Acts church, the, the, the church after Jesus ascended. So that's, mm. a, that's a, a starter. Yeah, well, the church that I went to that I mentioned before, um, people spoke in tongues. They alleged that they did, but it, they, there was never an interpreter. It was just yeah. muttering of words in an empty space. Um, there was no interpreter at all. And I remember initially feeling very uncomfortable, even though I was in that church, they were my friends. I remember standing there feeling uncomfortable because I had no idea what was going on. And I remember actually uh, going home and speaking to my father about it. And even though he's not completely reformed well, I, I'm not sure where my dad sits, actually. He's interesting with his theology, but I, I didn't think he was reformed. We went to a Baptist church growing up. Um, but he was sort of like, the first thing he said was, was there an interpreter? And I said, no. And he's like, stay away from it. Um, wow. And that was really interesting for me um, as like a 17-year-old girl getting that advice from my dad. Um, and so I did. I stayed away from it um, and I sort of just, let people do what they want. And now that I'm older and I look back at that particular point in my life, I can see um, why I felt uncomfortable now. I understand it a lot better, but it's funny. I, I did watch a little bit of, I think it was like a trailer for your film, Cessationist. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that somebody said in the trailer was that the understanding of the Holy Spirit um, has been lost. And um, that sort of struck me because even now myself, it's something that I, I feel like I understand better, but it's something I'm still learning. Um, and so w would you say that the understanding of the Holy Spirit is, leads to a big part of why people, um, I guess, still believe that these gifts are in practice today? Yeah, yeah. They, it, and there's, it's very interesting that... Um, so Jesus says that he's going to send a helper when he's before he ascends, before uh, he leaves them. Uh, he says, I'm, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send a helper. And that's what Pentecost is. They're, these Everybody's gathered me up a room and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Uh, this, this helper that Jesus promised. Um, so th so this Pentecostal movement coming out of Pentecost or um, th there's other names for people to practice these things. But uh they have this huge focus on the Holy Spirit. It's like their their favorite subject. It's the thing they always want more of. It's always about the Holy Spirit. But if you look at the New Testament, yes, the Holy Spirit is he's he is God Himself. So absolutely glorious and worthy of praise and worship, and we can pray to the Holy Spirit and all, all of these things. But the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. He makes little of Himself, and He points to Jesus. Uh, so Jesus is the star of the show. And the Holy Spirit is uh, acts as th the spotlight to always point us back to Jesus. So Christians shouldn't have this obsession with the Holy Spirit uh, be because the Holy Spirit, what he actually does is apply his Christ and his work to us. Uh, th and that's the most important thing that he does. So, yes, miracles exist. And even as a cessationist, cease you know, that's the, the root word of cessationist is that these gifts have ceased. The, so the idea is that, uh, that again, the offices have ceased, but God still performs miracles. God can do anything. We're not, we're not, um, uh, you know, saying that, that God is limited in any way. Um, but, uh, people, I think one of the big confusions is that people don't realize that there's a purpose for miracles, um, even when you think about the Bible, a lot of people just think the Bible is this giant book in every page. There's some weird miracle happening, but that's really not true. Um, miracles have a purpose and they're always there to accentuate um, messengers uh, or new messages that God has given and, and to, to validate the messengers. So really it's like, so Moses, that was a really big event in scripture God was sending this deliverer. He needed his, his uh, word to be validated so that the Israelites knew that Moses was truly sent by God. So you get all these incredible miracles. You, you get 
you know, he's showing off these miracles in front of Pharaoh to convince him and he's not convinced. And then the 10 plagues happen, these insane miracles that are just devastating to Egypt, including killing the first son, the firstborn son in, in all of Egypt. And then you get the parting of the Red Sea, this amazing miracle. And that was so impactful that really, if you look at the Old Testament, uh, the Exodus story being delivered from Egypt is the gospel of the Old Testament. It's the thing they always point back to. God saved us from slavery in Egypt, and he gave us his promised land. And then the Israelites lived literally on, on miracle bread every single day for 40 years as manna rained from the sky. So this miraculous time, it had a purpose, and it was to validate this message and this messenger. Um, so there's Moses, then there's the prophets uh, that would condemn Israel. And then when Jesus comes, that's the other big event that miracles are, are all around. And so, uh, so th th there's a time and a place and a reason for, th for those things to happen. And if people understand that, then they also understand that, like, it's not just for me to like show off how cool I am as a Christian or that I have power or something. That's not, that's not the purpose of a miracle to begin with. And uh, for us to want that is very suspect because what we, what we should be desiring is to be satisfied in Christ to be glorifying God in our lives. Mm. Now you mentioned the word cease, which obviously means these particular gifts ceased at a certain time. Now the apostolic age is my understanding of it all but are you able to sort of explain when it ceased and and what the um apostolic age is for people who might not be aware of it um so yeah there's there's sort of some debate around like the the timing of the ceasing and actually to the extent uh that it ceases and so that's i i guess i'll just say uh wait to see the movie and uh hopefully that'll <laughs> answer all your questions uh, and I have some partners also that are that are working on this one with me, um, and they're so we're gonna you know find the best experts and 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 give all the the best biblical arguments for it. Um, but yeah, the idea is that uh, the apostles were just like Moses, right? The apostles were given these uh, this ability that they could literally just heal people with with the word. They could they could do it at at will whenever they wanted. They had the power to do it, um, which, I mean, to to claim something like that is crazy. And then people still do it though, right? They they have gatherings where they bring sick people in and they like they go around like pretending to heal these people and then they're not healed. It's it's just it's just awful and it makes Christ look bad. It's just so so evil. Um, but yeah, so the the apostles specifically were given these gifts and then there was a time the apostolic age when uh you know other people were prophesying and it seems like uh god was still speaking in a, in a real way through these people like like prophetically um and and one of the the really big things that we need to remember is that the canon at some point the canon all, all the the collection of all the books of the bible it came to an end so the canon is closed, and that means that God is no longer speaking in that way. He, he has nothing new to say because he said everything that was necessary to, to um, reveal Christ to us for our salvation and to look forward to you know what, what's to come in the future and how the world is everything we need to know about the end of the world, if that's something God wants us to know about. Um, it, it's been uh, finished. So it's the canon is closed, and that means anytime anybody claims to have a prophecy from God, they're basically reopening the canon and then mm. adding to the canon. And that in that thing that they're saying, you know, if some preacher gets up on the stage and said, I have a word from God, are you actually saying that the words that are coming out of your mouth right now are have the same authority and uh, perfection? as uh the scriptures themselves mm. so yeah that's a that's a, a huge claim and it's uh very problematic i think yeah uh it's um 
We live in an age, it's interesting, we live in an age where there are video cameras, everybody has one on their phone. You literally carry around a recording device with you everywhere you go. Yet, apart from some very <laughs> interesting footage where, you know, people are straightened up or their arms have grown longer or something like, th there isn't, where's the video footage that shows you people being, you know, raised from the dead? Where's the video footage of, um, you know, children coming back to life again. There, there, there is no footage and you've got to ask why. There's video footage for everything. You can't pick your nose in your car without the government seeing you do it. You can't, you can't do anything because there's footage everywhere, but we just don't seem to see credible footage of these things. And that's usually a question you've got to ask yourself why. Um, but I like what you said about, you know, the canon and it being finished and it being closed because so often I get people say, oh, I, I heard from God and he said this. I'm like, can you show me where it is in the Bible? Where, where does yeah. God say that, you know, in the Bible? Um, but sola scriptura and I guess, you know, script, uh, scripture being sufficient and finished and all those things, it's a lost, um, it's a lost, I guess, quality <laughs> in theology. People don't really understand that anymore. And one of the biggest arguments that I get when I talk about, you know, the gift ceasing um, and things like that is, well, Evelyn, how can you, how could you believe this? How could you limit the Holy Spirit? Um, you know, and this goes back to, I guess, the understanding of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people say it's like you're limiting God and his abilities. I'm like, I'm not limiting God or his abilities. I'm simply uh, limiting man's ability to do these things, not not God. As I said, um, you know, miracles can happen um, and they do certainly happen. So do you get that sort of argument as well? And how do you kind of counter those arguments when you get them? Well, yeah, I mean, there's that, that comes with anything. So, I mean, if you if you want to say anything is true, any any biblical doctrine uh, is true, then you're saying the opposite is not true. And then there's somebody who believes that who says that you're now limiting God. Um, but the bottom line is God has spoken in his scriptures and he puts quote unquote limitations on himself by making promises, by telling us that there's purposes for, for certain things. Um, so it's not, they're, they're not limitations to, to just, repeat back what, what God says about himself. Um, so, you know, to, to, to look at miracles, for example, and say that this isn't something that God is just, you know, willy nilly just using at all times to, to validate any guy's opinion, you know, uh, just, just any, any day of the week. Um, there's, you're, that's not a limitation you're putting on God. you you just have a biblical, understanding of the purpose that God has in miracles that he lays out in scripture for us. And the same thing is true of like, like election, you know, saying that God has chosen some people and, and not others. That's another thing where it's like, well, now you're limiting God. You're putting God in a box. It's, it's never putting God in a box to see that God has spoken. And then to say, I believe that this is true of God. And I believe he's going to uphold that and he's going to be consistent with that. So now if, if you want to say there's a box, then God built the box and God put himself in that box to, to, to help us so that we can understand how he operates. And he's not just a chaotic deity that, that changes every day. So th there have to be rules in place if God uh, wants to to make himself make any sense to us at all. And that's a good thing. It's, it's good for us to be able to know what God is like. Mm. Now at the, at the beginning of the, um, uh, of the podcast, you mentioned how once you saw something in the Bible, you couldn't unsee it. <laughs> it was just everywhere staring at you in the face about reform theology, Calvinism, sovereignty, election, things like that. Um, it's similar. Like I used to have this little yellow car and before I had a yellow car, I'd never seen a yellow car in my life. And then when I got a yellow car, everywhere I drove on the road, I saw a yellow car somewhere. It was just everywhere in my face. And I had family members say the same thing. I see yellow cars everywhere now, Evelyn. Um, and so I guess it's similar uh, with theology. Once you see something, 
in the scripture, in the word, in the canon, it's very hard to unsee it. And then it changes the lens that you're viewing scripture through uh, from that point onwards. And it's something that, you know, it goes for cessationist uh, theology as well. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it and it's kind of everywhere and it kind of hits you in the face. That's my experience anyway. But what I want to sort of ask you before we sort of wrap it up today is why do you think people um, are in a position today where things that are really obvious to some Christians is not as obvious to others. Ah, uh, man, isn't that the question? <laughs> um, I, I mean, just dumped that. It's, sorry. It's theology. <laughs> no, it's, it's, that's exactly, that's, that's good. It's, it's such an important question, but um, theology, people don't, they don't, they just don't want to put God in a box. They, but all that really means is they don't want to think too deeply. Um, and they, they really don't want to take a stand because that's, that's like the culture that we live in today, this chaotic insanity that we're all living in um, is, is putting so much pressure on us to, especially as Christians, to not put our foot down on anything. Like we can't say anything for sure even if we, so these, uh, I just heard today that the, um, I think it was NFL players. They, they, there was like five of them on an, on a team that chose not to, or no, there were baseball players that chose not to wear a pride, uh, patch on their uniform and all these news outlets are attacking them. And they, so this, this guy did an interview and he was basically like, you know, we, it's not that we hate, you know, the gay people or anything like that. It's, it's just, you know, they're welcome here and they're loved and all that, but you know, it's sort of that we're just Christians and we feel like that's not a lifestyle that we want to necessarily support, but it's fine that you do it. And so it's like, even them taking the stand, they were very apologetic about the stand and they were like, very like, they didn't want to actually say like, no, we actually disagree with this. And um, we, we just can't, cause you can't say that like, and still they would lose their jobs if they said anything about that. So, and I, I just feel like even lay people feel that pressure so much. And we felt it for such a long time. And we're also just sort of intellectually lazy in this culture. So theology is something we don't want to think about. It's, it's dangerous to be convinced of a position because that now you're responsible to actually uh, stand for it, which is terrifying. Nobody wants to stand for it for anything. So it's much easier to just say, you know, God's loving and he can do whatever he wants. And, uh, you know, don't judge anybody because, you know, you, you don't know. But but yes, we do. We we do know. We, we know how God feels about homosexuality. Right. Like we know how God feels about about these things and these are just like really basic things that not, aren't even hard to figure out in scripture um so if you can't even figure that out then my goodness you're not you're not going to get to the end of election because you're, you're it's not not a question you're ever ever even going to ask so yeah the church is in bad shape uh in that in that way but that's you know th that's why i i personally like the kinds of films that I'm making right now, it's, it's for the church. These aren't like attacks on people that are outside of the church that I want to condemn. Um, I'm actually criticizing the theology inside the church in hopefully a way that's loving and encourages Christians, my, my actual brothers and sisters in Christ to think more deeply about the things that they believe. Um, and, you know, just, just hoping them, hoping they'll, they'll come along and, uh, we can, we can, uh, you know, all just get better in our theology and, and, uh, improve in our ability to glorify God. That's, that's what I want. Well, I think it's amazing that you are doing these films. I think the church is very apathetic with its theology. And I think that um, over time, the apathy has been this silent killer. And it's part of why these uh, regressive theologies and, and uh, almost heretical theology theologies have infiltrated the church and the pulpit. Um, and I think it's so important that as Christians, we um, do be unapologetic about the truth 
that we are unapologetic and, and we're not ashamed to be honest with um, our criticisms of certain theologies. I think that it's a great uh, leveling, a great, um, you know, iron sharpens iron, and it's something that we have to do as Christians. And I often, when I say things, I have to address it at the beginning, Christian, comma, and then I say stuff, because as you mentioned, this is where I'm, I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, and, and it's not because I hate them or I, I think they're stupid. It's because, you know, and I'm sure it's the same for you. It, it's a place of love because, um, you know, like we want the best for our brothers and sisters, for our family, for the body of Christ, so that we can, um, I guess, move forward um, you know, and uh, spread the gospel, the true gospel, um, and disciple all nations. So I'm glad that you're in this space. It's 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 a void that we needed to have filled. So I'm so glad that you're here, and the quality of your work is amazing. Um, and you know, I guess your resume is is testament to that in itself. But I'm really excited for these things. If people want to watch the films that you've already made, um, or they want to get involved in. Um, I guess the lead up to cessation is being released. Where can they go to find and to support these these films? So uh, both movies that I've produced so far are available on lastlandfear.com. Uh, they're also yeah, streaming on Vimeo. You can get them on DVD. Uh, so just, you know, search Calvinist movie or uh, Spirit and Truth movie. So Calvinist, Spirit and Truth, those are my first two. And like I said, uh, cessationist is uh being fundraised right now um and actually you know it's a kickstarter so if the money doesn't get raised then the movie doesn't get made so uh head over to kickstarter if this sounds like a project that you think is worthwhile and you think this movie should exist uh head over to kickstarter uh look up cessationist and uh you can check out the trailer there you can see our sort of like pitch for what we want to do and uh, if you are, if you feel so inclined, please help fund the film. Amazing. Well, I really appreciate having you on here today, Les. It's been a, a privilege. Your work is incredible. Um, I hope people go and watch the films you've you've already made. And if they, you know, as you said, if they like it, they can go to the newest one and, and get behind it because as Christians, we need these resources more than ever. Um, but I, I would love to have you back on. If you have any other projects, let me know. would love to chat with you about it. And I really appreciate you taking the time out today to talk with me on the show. Awesome. No, this was a blast. Thank you so much for having me.